Patterns are an essential tool we use as designers. They can be used in really loud ways or more quiet ways. And sometimes we don't use them at all, but they actually are really useful for making design work become more interesting. A pattern is a type of visual texture. When an image or line of type is repeated many times, the patterns of lights and darks add dimension to a surface. Wrapping paper is a good example of pattern. Patterns can make excellent backgrounds and borders and layouts. Pattern uses the art elements in planned or random repetitions to enhance surfaces. These are things we see throughout our entire visual environment. So on the left here, you're seeing patterns in the wallpaper, but also there's patterns on the bedding and pillows that are being shown. So patterns are a way that we add texture and depth and interest to surfaces, and that applies to design as well. On the right, you're seeing all these wrapped packages, all with wrapping paper, and you're seeing striped patterns that are more regular, but then some organic patterns as well, where some interesting shapes are being used and repeated in maybe a more random way that create a lot of interest and really decorate the surface of these packages. Here's a really interesting use of pattern. This is by Farid Razulov. He's an artist out of Azerbaijan. And these are actually computer generated rooms that he creates where he takes carpet patterns and covers them on all of the surfaces, except for these white porcelain looking animals that he puts in the rooms. And it's just interesting to see a pattern completely flood and cover every surface of a space. To the left is pelicans in the lounge, and on the right is goats in the kitchen. But you can see that fun use of these patterns and these simulated environments that become really rich and beautiful. Both of these pieces were done in 2014. Patterns must be able to repeat or tessellate, and most great patterns hide their seams. So a good pattern can go on indefinitely. It has the ability to repeat and repeat and repeat, no matter how complex or simple it is, to cover a very large area or a small area. That's referred to as repeating or tessellating. And you can see on the left, we're actually showing you the portion of the pattern of all of these human-like characters. And then you can start to see how that same piece repeats four times to create that entire pattern. This one's pretty complex, so it's a little bit hard to see the actual original piece that is being repeated. The one on the right is a good example too. It's more simple in terms of its subject matter, these geometric triangular shapes, but it's really interesting how they weave together, which also hides its seams. It makes it harder to see how it repeats. Another great example of a repeating or tessellating pattern. What we want to avoid are things like this. This is really a computer glitch. It's really a pattern that wasn't built properly in Illustrator, but you can see on the left that things aren't perfectly seeming together. They're not gonna repeat correctly. It's been corrected on the right, and that's a much better example of this illustrated pattern of citrus. What we wanna avoid is the one on the left. I mean, it is more of an error that's happened here because the pattern wasn't built correctly, but also it's just not a strong pattern. It might be better if it was a little bit more complex if we found a better way to hide its seams. Patterns can also be really simple. Here's shapes and things you're familiar with from our first unit, the visual principles. But there's nothing wrong with simple patterns. These are just made with circles, lines, different geometric shapes, and they create a lot of interest and can be used to decorate a surface or add a certain mood. But patterns generally fall into different categories, and you might think about these different categories as you're making patterns. So one of them is geometric. Geometric patterns focus on the geometry for their style. They often feature simple shapes such as circles, triangles, rectangles, and lines. And although they use simple shapes, they can be made very complex or they can be very simple. So we just looked at some simple examples of geometric patterns, but let's look at some others. Here's some that are just using triangles and squares. The one on the right has some triangles that are overlaid in an interesting way, creating a nice use of positive and negative space. So relatively simple geometric patterns. Here's some that are a little bit more complex. The line work of the circles on the left and the way they overlap, or all of the interesting squares that are being used on the right in different colors to create a much more complex geometric pattern. We also have organic. Organic patterns have a fluidity that comes from their curved shapes and minimal use of straight lines. They reference natural shapes and are not geometric. They sometimes reference nature, but not always. So here's some example of ones that are organic. On the left, we have sort of a floral-like pattern that's being created with all of these curved lines. On the right, we have a very abstract organic pattern. It's just kind of these blob-like shapes that have different transparencies and layer over each other in a really interesting way. This is actually from a piece of fabric. Here's some that reference a little bit more of things in nature. The left is this organic pattern of this stem of leaves. They kind of fit together in a really interesting way, and then there's dots that are used as line work around those motifs. 
The one on the right is a really interesting kind of optical illusion pattern that sort of references water. We have all these lines that taper and move in different ways to create this sort of wave-like pattern. Then we have abstract. Abstract patterns are invented and are heavily stylized from real-world imagery or avoid references to imagery in the real world altogether. They come in many styles and can even be organic or geometric. So some examples of more organic abstract patterns. These are really interesting. The one on the left, this black line work that's done in a very monolinear style, but sort of has this organic feeling to it. It's completely abstracted. Also because the black and the white has a similar line weight, it has this really interesting positive negative effect that makes it really interesting to look at. Or the one on the right looks almost like paint is mixing together in water and kind of warping together. It has this very interesting organic abstraction to it. Here's another one with just blobs and lines, very random shapes that were created and mixed together. Or the one on the right that does lean a little bit more on geometry, although it's very hand done. We're seeing rectangles and line work that are seen together in interesting colors to create a really fun abstract pattern. We have illustrated. Illustrated patterns feature illustrated elements that are representational and directly reference things in the real world. They can be rendered in many different styles and are quite useful when you want to use a pattern that has identifiable imagery. So here we have the one on the left, this really beautiful hand-done illustrated texture of lemons. So we know that those are lemons. It's done in a nice color palette. There's a nice change between the different styles of the lemons and the way their leaves are rendered. Or the one on the right, which is referencing water. We have all of these interesting lines that come in these circular motifs and these wave-like shapes that come in that help us see that this is referencing water. Here's some other fun ones that reference animals. The one on the left is a Mary Mecco pattern. It's a really famous pattern from a Finnish design firm. So we see all of these different animals, foxes and bears and birds. The one in the middle is a pattern that is common from an indigenous people of Mexico called the Otomi. This is actually all done with embroidery. It's really beautiful, but they often feature different animals from that region. Or the one on the right is a pattern of penguins. It's very geometric. It's really interesting the way they have abstracted that penguin. And this was done by Fatoshi Nakanishi. It's a really interesting one. So you can see those penguins and then they create interesting shapes between them. We also have handcrafted. Handcrafted patterns showcase elements that make them look like they were made by hand. There's an imperfection to these patterns that reference tools or processes like painting, carving, or printing. So some of the patterns we saw already were considered handcrafted as well. Sometimes patterns will fall in multiple of these categories, which I know can make it confusing, but sometimes it's good to just see these different buckets or classifications of patterns that will help you think about what you might want to create and how it might evoke a certain kind of mood or style in your piece. There's a fun one on the left that has a little bit of a geometric quality to it. We have all these kind of abstract polygon-like shapes that are flooded with these different beautiful colors. And then there's line work that runs through them, but the line work's actually really imperfect. It breaks in some places. It's not a consistent line weight. So it almost feels like it's been carved. Or the one on the right, this bright colored pattern that looks like it's made of cut paper. It almost feels like someone cut a bunch of construction paper and layered it on top of each other and then played with transparency to make this really fun handmade looking pattern. Here's some more, the one on the left, all of these different line work that all again, it undulates. It's not a consistent line weight. There's an imperfection to this that really makes it feel like the entire thing was done by hand. Or the one on the right that's really playing with texture. All those little line segments that are created are very imperfect and they're very handmade looking. On top of it, a texture has been applied to it that gives it a roughness that really accentuates this idea that this is a handmade pattern. You also have typographic patterns. Those use typography, letters, or even type-based logos as their base. Letter forms can be a great starting point for patterns because of their wonderful shapes and designs. These patterns can be especially useful to graphic designers in branding-oriented projects. So there's some examples of patterns being created out of simple numbers and letters. The left is a two and a seven that have been locked and linked together in an interesting way to create a seamless pattern. The one on the right is an uppercase R where the stems have been lined up with each other to create these vertical bands that run through the pattern. But then there's the interesting other shapes of the letter forms that break up that other space. Here's an example from Leah Faust. She's a designer from Los Angeles. This is paper that's used inside of pastry boxes for a famous restaurant in Los Angeles called Bottega Louie. But you can see that they're using their logo and repeating it and creating this typographic pattern on this tissue paper. Here's another example. This is from Kevin Cantrell. He's a designer from Salt Lake City, Utah. And this is for Fetchum Park. This is a high-end event space in the UK, and they have this beautiful pattern that uses the Fetchum logo that he created as a part of the pattern. There's gradient. 
Gradient patterns are based on a color treatment where one color transitions into another. These can be built on the computer using two or more colors and can also have different directional qualities. They can be difficult to work with in certain situations because it can be tough to get them to repeat or seam over large areas. But we do see these a lot on the web. Gradient patterns are really common in that space. It doesn't mean we don't see them in print, but they are really useful. Again, it just can be sometimes hard to make them actually repeat. It's usually a pattern that you create for a certain area and it maybe grows in size or shrinks in size to fit the space as opposed to repeating like some of the other patterns that we looked at. So here's two gradient patterns. One on the left is more subtle. It's kind of a peach tone. It goes from some kind of a yellowish tone to more of a pinky tone and creates this kind of beautiful, simple, soft gradient. Or the one on the right that's using multiple colors. There's red, blue, yellow that creates these magentas and oranges in between them. So both examples of gradient patterns but I think you can see how these might be hard to repeat. They would be more something that you would scale. Here's some that do have some repeating qualities to them. These are gradients that are being used inside of shapes. So on the left, you have all these blobs that are being used, this very abstract organic pattern, but then has this quality of these gradients being applied to those blobs, gives it almost an iridescent-like quality. The one on the right as well, we just have simple lines or rectangles that are being filled with different gradients. And again, one that might be easier to repeat because the shapes that contain the gradients could be repeated to create a more seamless pattern. Here's some patterns used in work. This is a piece by Andrew Littman. He's a designer out of Boulder, Colorado. It's for Nomad Hill. It's a travel design company. So they design travel for people, like trips and things that you might do. But you can see on the back of the letterhead, and some of the business cards have all of these really interesting patterns. So they're taking some of the illustrative elements from the brand and kind of grouping them together. But then even those objects that are being used have patterns inside of them. If you look at the back of the letterhead, there's sort of buildings that you see or rectangular forms that are filled with line work or simple dot patterns. So a lot of layering of pattern here to create a really interesting dynamic brand. Sometimes we use pattern to reference culture. This is the Curry Up Now food truck, which was designed by Nicole Lafave from San Francisco. And you can see that this is a food truck that serves curry and other Indian food. And they're really referencing all of these beautiful Indian patterns and sort of splitting up the truck and having it flood different areas. It makes it something that you might not miss. If you saw this on the street, you'd definitely look at it and be curious about it because of the bright colors and this fun use of pattern. But another way that pattern can be used in design. If we're talking about cultural patterns, it's also something that we want to make sure that we use appropriately. We don't want to appropriate a pattern and put it in a place that it shouldn't be. We want to be authentic in the way that we use patterns. So it's something that you want to consider. There is a book that's quite interesting, though. It was made in 1856 by Owen Jones, and it's called The Grammar of Ornament. And what's interesting about it is it actually splits patterns up into different cultures or areas of the world, which can be a great way to go and look for patterns that are historical, it can also help you make sure that you use them appropriately and you don't steal patterns and put them somewhere that they shouldn't be. You really want to use cultural patterns wisely. Here's an example we've shown before, but this is from Amuki Studio. It's by Vanessa Zuniga Tinzare. She's from Ecuador, and this is her Tinku pattern. It's actually a font that you're seeing on the right. It's a series of shapes that she created and came from research she did in cultural anthropology museums in Ecuador. And these shapes can actually be seen together through the typeface to create different patterns. This was done in conjunction with a type foundry called Sutipos. And she even created this virtual environment where the patterns live. The left is what she calls the Tinku house, which has all of the patterns from the typeface inside of it. So every surface or most of the surface are flooded with these patterns. And it was sort of this interesting promotional tool that was created to promote the typeface and the patterns that she created. We also see patterns in all kinds of places. This is something that isn't just for designers that work in the web or in graphic design, but we see it in places like homes. We looked at this at the beginning where we have different wallpapers being mixed here. We have different patterns actually on the pillows and the fabric that it's used in this space. So patterns are something you'll see a lot in interior design. You also see it in architecture. Here's an example of breeze blocks on the top of this building. These are cement blocks that seam together to create this pattern that creates a little bit of privacy and interest to the building. There's even pattern on the garage door and those long slats that create that door, or even the brickwork that makes the wall on the right-hand side. This is an image of a house in Perth, Australia, that was designed by Joseph Kalasara. So you can see a lot of use of pattern in the facade of this house that makes it really interesting and engaging. Here's some more examples of patterns inside spaces. We have this carved handmade pattern on the left that's on the front of this cabinet door. 
or there's this really richly textured and patterned space on the right. We have rugs that sort of overlap each other that are of different styles. We have sort of a wicker table that has an example of a pattern. And there's all different kinds of pattern pillows on that daybed or that couch as well. Here's examples of patterns used in more of a graphic design setting, although it is also an interior design setting. These are tile floors. The left we have the St. Francis Bar and Eatery. This was done by Studio MLPS in Minneapolis. But you can see that logo that was created by these designers is actually being created in tile and laid into the floor of the space. The right we have a piece by Nick Masani. He's a designer and he created these things called Fosaics. They're actually fake. This is a fun one that says San Diego, but these are actually fake tile floors that Nick creates painstakingly in Photoshop that reference, you know, tile patterns and floors and he puts different city names into them. So it's kind of funny and that's why he calls them Fosaics. We see pattern a lot in clothing, in fashion design. Here's some work from Kenzo's Ready to Wear Runway Show in spring 2016. And you can see that there's a large use of patterns and clashing patterns and really loud color patterns that are making these clothes interesting. Here's an example of patterns being used on the web. This was done by a designer out of Lyon, France, and it's for the Mirage Festival. And you can see all kinds of uses of patterns that really create a more dynamic, a little bit of a richer experience on this website. From this actual gradient pattern that moves on the website, and then this fun line pattern that's at the top in the hero section of the website. So it gives you an idea of the mood of the style of this festival and also just makes something that's really interesting to look at. Here's some business cards for a person who creates rugs. Her name's Julie Dasher. This was designed by Lori DeMartino from Minneapolis, but it makes sense. This person sells rugs and designs rugs, so they actually want to show patterns that might appear on rugs. So there's these different patterns that are actually embossed and letterpress printed on all of the cards. It's also fun that there's different versions of them, which is really neat because it shows the diversity of the kinds of rugs that this person creates. Patterns can also be really subtle. On the left, here's some work from Pentagram, their London office. This is the Dorchester Hotel collection identity. And you can see that the logo is actually being patterned together and then it's printed with like a spot varnish, which makes it a little bit shiny, makes it really subtle in the way that it's used. Or the one on the right, this is a piece by Lulu and D Design and Letterpress from Los Angeles. And it's their business cards for a home goods store called Cotton and Flax. And what's neat is you can see around the logo each time is a debossed pattern. So here pattern is a tactile thing. It's something you touch. It's not necessarily something that is physically printed. So it's another fun way to use pattern in a more subtle way. Here's Mass Brothers Chocolate. This is a chocolate company that was really famous because when it first came out, they used old vintage wrapping paper as their packaging. They don't really do that anymore, but they still reference that idea. And so every single kind of chocolate is wrapped in a different pattern that helps the consumer identify the different kinds of chocolate that come in the mass line. This particular redo was designed by Original Action Group, a group that's out of Los Angeles. Here's more on the web. This is another fun website for Rock Werchter. This was done by Tin in Amsterdam, but you can see there's this pattern on the right, this kind of fun angular line pattern, but then also there's a pattern that's happening on that ticker that runs down below. It's sort of these circles and ovals that seem together to create this border. So another fun way that we use pattern to activate a website. Here's patterning and packaging. This is some wine packaging. This was done by a studio called Atipus in Barcelona. But you can see that each of the different wines from this winery have a different pattern that seem together. So you're seeing the symbol on the upper left, but then you can see how it repeats together on the wine label itself. Again, this helps identify the different products, creates a really great system. There's probably a lot of different wines that come from this winery. So if they need to create a new label, they kind of have a structure that they can follow to create the next one. And then they're done in metallic, which is really interesting and gives it a little bit more of a luxe feel. Here's some book covers created by Coralie Bickford Smith. These are all from F. Scott Fitzgerald. So all of his different famous books. You can see these beautiful patterns that are being run on all of them. And they're all done in metallic inks, which also again, give it that really rich feel. It's really beautifully done, but nice use of pattern. Pattern is definitely the star of the show in this piece. It's also the star in this piece. This is by Studio Growl. 
They're from Germany, and this is Soul Spice. So this is a company that sells different spices. But I love how they use different colors and different patterns to identify the different kinds of spices. So imagine if you were looking at a shelf and trying to find a certain spice, it's really fun that they have this color and pattern system that helps you identify the different spices that are out there. It also just creates something really fun and engaging that would be really nice to look at on a shelf. Here's a very simple example of pattern on the web. In the upper right of this health grades website, you'll see these plus signs that sort of rotate and animate in a really interesting way. This was done by Thunderfoot. They're a studio out of New York City, but just a good example of a very simple, subtle pattern that's used on a website. There's obviously also the gradient pattern behind all of that. That doesn't move or animate, but it's another example of a pattern like we talked about. Here's mica. This is the Maryland Institute College of Art. This is an identity that was created by Pentagram, particularly the partner Abbott Miller who works in their New York City office. But it's really neat how there's these really simple geometric patterns that you can see in the middle. And that's actually a zoom in of the M in the MICA logo because the MICA logo has this kind of system where there's these strips of horizontal patterns that run through the identity and kind of represent the different art forms that they do within this college and it kind of shows how they're related and how they fit together. There's another fun example of pattern. This was done by Pentagram as well. Michael Beirut, another partner from the New York City office. It was a rebrand for Saks Fifth Avenue. So Michael and his team looked at old logos from Saks and selected the one on the right and redid their logo. But then for their packaging system, they actually took the logo and split it up and then kind of rotated and jumbled it together to create the patterns that you see on the left. Those were used in the shopping bags, the wrapping paper, the tissue paper, all different applications of the Saks Fifth Avenue brand. So here they're actually taking the logo, splitting it up and rotating it and creating a really interesting pattern out of those shapes that are in the typography. So we also have borders. Those are related to patterns, but they're not quite the same as a pattern. Borders are decorative and use repetition like patterns, but in horizontal or vertical bands. They can range from a simple line to more intricate and ornate. So they do have a repetition component sometimes, but they're not meant to repeat into infinity. They're really meant to be used in one vertical or horizontal area. So here I have a bunch of vertical lines that are being used to create examples of borders. So again, everything from a thin to a thick line to maybe dots or multiple lines that are mixed together. Borders are often used to divide or separate content visually. It's something you see a lot on menus. Oftentimes when you look at menus, there's borders that are being used to help you see the different sections, like on this piece for Zobler's Delicatessen. This was done by Club. They're a design studio in Los Angeles. But you can see that there's these lines that are dividing the signature sandwiches from the brunch, right? There's even special borders being used, like in the lower right for that breakfast deluxe. It has a special fancy border around it. So different borders are being used here to divide information and sort of help you guide around the menu. Even down in the bottom left where there's the matzo ball soup, the cob salad, the noshes, and the sweets, there's just a very simple line. It's not a full border that connects into a rectangle, just a simple line that's dividing those two sections. So really nice use of a lot of different kinds of borders to create interest. And those can be really simple. This one on the left has a lot of borders as well, both ones that are containing an entire area like in side dishes and cocktails, but also ones that are just splitting up areas. But all of these borders are just simple lines. Some of them are double lines, some of them are single lines, but an example of really simple borders that are really enhancing the mood of this particular establishment. Then we have the one on the right, Boucherie. This was designed by Savvy Studio. They're a studio out of New York City. And those are really neat because they're using more complex borders, more illustrative Art Nouveau inspired borders that are being used, like in that center area for the dinner or at the bottom for the formage and charcuterie. Really interesting ways that they're using borders. There's even some simple borders that are dividing the section like in the left for hors d'oeuvres. There's kind of that salad area on the right and then the soup area on the left. They're using a simple line to divide those sections. So they're often used as a crucial element to add structure, to frame or divide information. They can add a lot of elegance. They can also help with the hierarchy and guide your eye to a specific thing that you want someone to look at. Here's an example of just the diversity of borders. They can be curved, they can be scalloped, they can be zigzag, they can be broken. Here's more, these are more illustrative where we're using floral motifs or leaf motifs, triangles, rainbows, wavy patterns, even the one at the very bottom on the left which is just like a scribble. So almost anything can become a border, and again, they can be really useful to divide content.
We also see borders being used outside of our specific study of design. On the left, we have an example of a border in landscape design. Here we have this wavy rock border that's running along this grass area and it's separating it from this wooden deck. So another example of a border being used as a divider, but this time in landscape. On the right, we have an example through tile. There's a decorative piece of tile that's being run between the cap, that upper part of the tile and the bottom, that's creating a decorative edge that denotes where that tile ultimately is going to end. So another example of borders being used in other areas of design that are not our own. We even see it on cakes. When you see cakes being decorated at the bottom, there's this beautiful piping work that's helping delineate the bottom of the cake from the surface that it sits on. So it's a way to decorate that edge. It's a good example of a border, but from food here in a cake. Here's two examples of invitations, and both of them have borders. The one on the left has a more illustrative border. The one on the right has a very geometric border with multiple layers of color. Both beautiful examples of borders being used in design. Here's borders being used around a logo. There's actually a border around this courtesy logo that's kind of holding everything together. Here we're looking at it on an actual window, so that's why there's a little bit of a reflective quality. This was done by Austin Petito. He's a designer out of Redwood City, California, and this is signage for a bar in Orlando, Florida. But you can see how that border is kind of holding everything together. There's lots of type happening in here. Orlando, Florida, the pleasure is ours, the courtesy is yours, right? And there's kind of these spaces within the borders, so this whole thing locks up together and has much stronger gestalt. Here's borders being used for a event designer. This is Lisa Vorse. This was done by Device Creative out of North Carolina, but you can see these really beautiful borders that are being used around event design and production. There's all this kind of interesting decorative borders that are being layered together to create something really beautiful. And then although we can't see the whole thing behind, you can see there's also borders being used on the back of this business card that just splits up the various information that's being used. So very decorative, very elegant use of borders, a nice use of mixing lots of borders together as well. Here's a business card on the left by Ren Takaya in Japan. And you can see this really interesting border that's running around the outside of this card. It's really geometric and interesting. There's a lot of line work. Some places have dots, really beautiful, how it has kind of an interesting shape to it. It's not really a straight border, the way it kind of pinches and tightens in certain areas. And then on the right, a very old vintage logo. This is something that was created, but you can see that kind of border of the crown and that leaf work that surrounds the B and the typography. Here's borders that incorporate photography. On the left is a piece where I love how the watermelon actually comes on top of the border. So if you look on the left and the lower right, the border looks like it's going behind the watermelon. But then if you look at the top, the border actually comes on top of the watermelon. So there's a little bit of a weaving effect happening with the photography, which is really nicely executed. The right is another interesting one. This is from Future Department, which is a studio in Hong Kong. And actually they have the photo of the woman with a white border around it, but then there's a photo of some kind of foliage around that, and the way that's being framed, it's almost like the photo is becoming a border as well. Here's a piece from CLDA. There is a studio in London, England, and this is packaging for Boots line of beauty products. Boots is a drug store from the UK, although we do see some of their products here in the United States, but what's really interesting is the use of all of these different borders. Every product has a different border, there's a unification in the color palette and the style of the borders, but you can see that there's more illustrated borders, more simple borders. Some of them are rectangular. Some of them have interesting shapes. So lots of borders that are driving this design and making it something that we like to look at. It gives it a little bit more of a vintage, almost apothecary-like feel. Here's one with lots of borders. This is work from Kevin Cantrell, a designer out of Salt Lake City, Utah. This is a piece he did for the AIGA Awards show in Salt Lake City. And you can see it's just all these borders. This is kind of a more plus more approach. It's something you see a lot from Kevin Cantrell. I have another example from him as well. But you can see there's just all these borders that are being layered together. There's a really limited color palette here. It's got this more luxe kind of feeling to it, which makes sense for an award show. But it's a really beautiful use of borders and allowing borders to be the focus and the star of the show. Here's another one from Kevin, but this time this is packaging. This is for Commonwealth Coffee Company. And this is the bags that the packaging comes in. And you can see that there's this beautiful logo and all these things going on. But then the whole rest of the bag above and below that logo zone are just these stripes of different geometric patterns that layer together and repeat to really make this beautiful pattern. This is almost one that kind of is hard to distinguish. Is this a border or is this a pattern? But I would say because there's that strong linear motif being used, it's a little bit more of a border that's being repeated. 
Here's simple borders from Louis Philly. Again, packaging. This is for Bonnie's jams. And you can see these beautiful little borders that are being used with just simple circles, simple dots that repeat. Sometimes they're double rows, sometimes they're single rows, but it's really dividing the space and giving us a clear idea of what information goes with each other. Here's another piece from Luis Philly, the designer in New York City. This one's a little bit more illustrative. We have some simple borders between the words themselves. But then we have these decorative areas at the top and the bottom with these kind of swirls that run around and create this really interesting, almost wrought iron-like motif. Here's more work from Luis Philly, but this time these are logos. Borders are something we see oftentimes in logos as well. It'll be something you'll be focusing on a little bit on this assignment. But you'll notice on the far left, there's this postage stamp inspired logo. And it has this beautiful border that runs around the outside of that illustrative motif with the typography inside. The middle one also features illustration, but the borders this time are much simpler for American Spoon. It's just simple line work, but it really helps hold all of that information together and makes it read as a cohesive logo. And the right's fun. It's a more of a triangular logo, but we have this decorative, almost Italian art deco like border that's running around the outside for this gelato company. So all logos from Luis Philly, good examples of uses of borders in logos. Let's look at more examples of borders and logos, because again, this will be really similar to what you do on this assignment. But here's some that are really simple. We have simple letter forms or logos in the middle of these shapes, and they're all done with simple lines. But the one for ASKE, it breaks in some areas. We also have the one to the right of that, which is an old pharmacy logo, and it's a little bit more oblong. It's not a complete circle. Or I love the one on the far right, this is for a business academy out of Germany, and the actual border is really thin. It's referencing the thin part of that type. These are examples of breaking lines, using thick lines, thin lines, all good examples of using borders for some kind of a strategy with a logo. Here's some that also use lines as well, but in an interesting way. The one on the left is for an airport restaurant in Zurich. And you can see how there's some white space flowing through. The border actually is attaching back to the typography, create a little bit of this swirling motif that might sort of reference a propeller. And then one over from that, there's this really interesting logo where there's a thick line and then a thin line inside of it, which is really creating nice unity with the typography. And it's making it look like it's almost two lines. It actually could be two lines with just a very thin amount of space between them, but a fun way to use multiple lines. And then one to the right of that, sort of the opposite. There's more space between them, which gives it a different feeling. Then we have the one with the B. That's for uh, Agency of Motivational Speakers. It's called Brand the Speaker, and it was done by Mode Design. But it's really neat how they're breaking that thick border around the edge with just a small triangular element that makes it feel like the B is sitting within a speaking bubble. The right's a fun one too. This is for a furniture company. And we have two shapes being mixed, which creates a neat border. We have this angular shape on the outside with a circle on the inside, which creates something that's really neat, the way that those two shapes are interacting. Here's one that uses even more lines. The one on the left is for the VW Foundation. So it's a foundation arm of the car company, but they've taken that main logo that we all know, and they've put all these really interesting lines around it that make it feel really dynamic. The one in the middle is for Circo Bar. This is a bar in the UK. And the C is in the middle, and then there's this almost maze-like structure that runs around it as a border. Or the one on the far right, which is for an architecture firm, where the P actually connects and creates this interesting line work that creates this neat shape, almost like a baseball diamond. Here's some where we use different shapes. On the left, we almost have a gear-like border. So it's a line with these sort of rectangular shapes that are attached to it that almost reference like a gear. Or one to the right of that. This is an Italian plastics company, and they're sort of creating a border out of a geometric shape, but then at all the corners, they're putting these larger circles. Then there's an import-export logo with that big H where they're breaking it, and the breaking of that border is really referencing the stenciled style typography of that H. Then we have the one on the far right, that ID, that's from a management consultancy company in France, actually. And there's these hexagons that are running around and creating this really interesting border to contain that ID. Sometimes we can use borders to feel more elegant. They can be more pretty. Sometimes we do that through thinner line work or more ornate line work, like the one on the left. This is for an interior design company. This logo was done by Kiss Miklos. He's a designer, it was done in 2012. But we have that LXE in the middle, and then we have this beautiful faceted sort of border that was created around it. 
The one to the right of that, that AB, this is for a retail company in Norway. Well, we have this beautiful border being created by just these little lines. It's almost two lines that are created, but the lines actually have a broken quality to them that sort of makes it feel like it's radiating. Then we have the one with the A to the right of that, where we have this interesting logo that has a little bit of a decorative quality to it. There's a thick, thin relationship, which relates to the typography inside of it. And there's this little tiny swoosh on each side on the right where the logo sort of comes in and contains that A. The last one's for a magazine in Mexico. This was done by Face. And we have a simple line border here, but it actually undulates. There's a curve to it, right? It almost feels like it's some kind of a wax seal. Here's some others that have a little bit more of a hand-done quality or a high-end quality. The left is an art institute in Sweden, and we have some simple double lines that help contain the typography with the symbol in the middle. Or a personal logo that was done by Louise Philly for Cynthia White. That's the one with the CW of this beautiful CW monogram. And then we have a white line, a thick black line, and then a dotted line all around it that makes it feel a little bit more premium, a little bit more hand done. Then we have another logo that actually is really trying to feel hand done. It actually has a rough quality to it. The circle that's surrounding that VGR is really rough. It's purposefully imperfect so that it makes it feel like it's a lot older. And then I love the one on the right for that ISH. It's actually a French pharmacy. This was designed by Raymond Lowy in 1963. But again, you have the border breaking on the right and the left side, which allows air to sort of come into the logo and creates a bit of a swirling motif. I also love how the border actually has a thick thin relationship here that's referencing the type. So there's really strong unity between the typography and the border and the way that they're rendered. Here's some that are even wilder, even more advanced and kind of ornate borders. The far left where we have this A in the middle that's almost hard to see because there's these kind of swirling circular shapes that completely contain it. Then one to the right of that is actually for a wine company. And here we have a very simple A contained in a very simple circle, but there's this sort of knot-like structure that surrounds it and creates this very ornate border. Then there's the one with the M with the dots. This is for a music center in Helsinki, and we have that M, and those dots are also placed around the M as a border. And they kind of get larger as they come away from the M, which sort of makes it feel like it's radiating. It almost has a sound-like quality to it. And there's one that's sort of referencing the sun. We have these sort of S-like kind of sun ray motifs that are surrounding this G. And then the far one on the right also sort of referencing the sun or organic structures or water. We have these almost droplet-like shapes that are curving and surrounding that S that's knocked out of that circle. So all things that are very much related to what you'll be doing on one of the assignments for this section. But sometimes logos are actually created just with the border. These are examples of logos that are all just a border, although there's not typography in it, which will be required on your assignment. These are interesting borders that I found that just work in isolation as logos. The one on the left is actually for a beauty brand out of the UK called Replenish. And it's just this really interesting sunray like structure, but it's very organic. It feels very hand done. Then one to the right of that is actually for a healthcare company. We have this interesting mixing of these circular shapes that create this really neat, almost faceted border. Then we have the one to the right of that, which is actually for a Genomic Disorders Research Center in Australia. It's done by Sadgrove Design. And it's neat how the border is actually relating to DNA and that kind of double helix structure. And the last one on the right is for a jeweler. It's interesting how it doesn't go all the way around. There's a very faceted quality to it as well, which I think really relates to the kind of jewelry that this Irish jeweler designer creates. So interesting examples of borders used on their own. Although again, for your assignment, you will have to have typography in the middle. It's good to see other examples of how borders can be used just on their own for a logo. So let's talk a little bit about the assignments that you'll be doing for this section of the course. So the first one is a pattern assignment where you'll actually be creating a seamless pattern. So in this assignment, you will build a unique pattern of your choosing. You will create three patterns in total. There is a template that will allow you to build patterns through a swatch, and then each pattern will be shown in black and white as well as color. So three patterns, but each one is going to be shown in color and black and white. So you'll sort of end up with six compositions in total. Although again, some of them will just be the same pattern in color and black and white. There is a software tutorial for this that will help you and give you different strategies of how to make these patterns. But we're really here to make that seamless pattern that you could create that could go on into infinity. So there's examples of this. So we have the swatch on the left and then on the right, you can see that pattern applied and how it repeats. Both of these are shown in color. 
But again, there would be a black and white version of each of these as well. So the second part of this assignment, you'll be dealing more with borders. In this assignment, you will explore the possibilities of borders. You will start by creating or finding a symbol or icon that you will use at the center. Then you'll explore creating borders around this item. Sometimes try emphasizing the icon and sometimes try emphasizing the border. You'll play with different techniques. There's a software tutorial for this one as well that will go over strategies of how to create borders in Illustrator. There's also a template that you'll use to keep your work organized. But here's a little bit of how this might look. This student selected an N and then really explore different strategies and different kinds of borders that could surround that N. So you'll be creating six of these in total and we wanna see different kinds of borders that you explore and how that can emphasize the border or the thing that's contained within it and also what kinds of relationships you can create between the style of the letter form or symbol in the center and the actual border itself. So as always, if you have any questions about this or need help, you're always welcome to write your instructor, but I hope you'll enjoy learning a little bit more about patterns and borders and playing with them in the software.